I welcome you here to the Richland Center Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our call to worship today is found in Psalms 136, 1 through 3. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. At this time, the praise team will come up. Good morning. Please stand. We'll turn to, for our first hymn, 465, I Heard the Voice of Jesus, 465. cross 312 
to 121. Go tell it on the mountain. 121.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for having brought us to your house of worship as your family today, from near and far. And as we are gathered together at your invitation, we invite you to be at the center of this worship in everything that is sung, said, everything that is thought, that our worship may be in spirit, inspired by you and pleasing to you, as well as a blessing to each one of us and to those that we will touch this week as we go from this place. So thank you, and please bless us with your presence. In the name of Jesus, amen. Turn to hymn number 103. Please stand. For the lovely praise time. At this time, for those who can please kneel as far as possible, we'll come together in prayer. Heavenly Father, what a joyous day. As church clerk, I get to feel just a tiny, tiny bit of what you feel as I write those new names in our church clerk book. Father, I can't imagine the joy that you feel as you put their names down. You've been watching over them since before they were even born, and you know them so intimately. Lord, we are just so glad that they have joined our little church here. Lord, I also ask that you watch over each one that is here otherwise too, Lord. Because even though we're here, we still have issues and we have problems. We need your hands to hold on to us tight and to wrap your arms around us when times of trouble. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us this week and your watch care for taking care of us. We ask that you be with those who are ill and not here today. I think of the Sylvia family. I know they've been quite ill this week. And Lord, I just pray that they're having a wonderful Sabbath with you at home. Father, I especially ask that you be with Pastor Sam today as he gets ready to give us your message. Lord, I just pray that you touch him. And as I asked, watch over those who are doing the Bible studies, Father. We just pray for them. 
In Jesus' dear name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our scripture text today is found in Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Pastor Sam will bring his message. It's not the first time that my heart is drawn towards that particular text. And um, it's one that my mother quoted to me when I was in Jerusalem with her uh, a couple of weeks ago. And she added to this, one is young when they have hope in their heart. I mentioned this morning at school, there's a few things that, like everybody else, she's bothered by in her life. But... She mentioned that text and then said, one is young when they have hope in their heart. And I, I, I'm guilty of having changed the title, Secret of Strength, because I thought, well, Clifford is not here today. But we still have some people of older age, and all of us are of older age. And so I should have kept the title, Secret of Youth or Eternal Youth. And that secret, according to my mom and according to this text, is very simple. <laughs> is trusting in a God who is unwearied and who has strength for wearied humans. Secret of both strength as well as eternal youth is trusting in an unwearied God with ceaseless energy as we can see in the movement of the seasons, of the stars, in the energy that we see everywhere in nature. A God who is unwearied, trusting in that God who has strength in store to give to sometimes wearied humans. And I'll expound on this from that text. Those who wait on the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as you've given us this text, we pray that it will bring to us, each one of us, individually, that have come in your house of worship today, something that through the ministry of your Holy Spirit will give us the strength that we need for the remainder of this day, this week, this year, and this life. And we thank you for answering this prayer as we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this is such a well-known text. And you would think, you know, in Micah, there's two texts people know by memory, right? Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. He has shown you, O man, what God requires, if not to walk humbly and practice justice, all these things. One text in the book of Micah. Do you know any other? Habakkuk. One text that you all know by memory. Be silent before the Lord. Church of my youth, it was as a big sign at the entrance of the church for the kids not to make too much noise. In many books of the Bible... You find one special such verse, that's it. One per chapter, perhaps. However, in Isaiah, by the time that you get to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 31, there's a whole chapter of which that verse is the culmination. Some scholars think that 
Isaiah is divided in two parts, 1 through 39, which contains a lot of the Messianic prophecies at the beginning. And then after that, from chapter 40 on, they call this the Deutero, Deutero, Deutero <laughs> Isaiah. And that is a second Isaiah that they think might have been written at the time of the exile to encourage those that were in Babylon. So, of course, many times we will not subscribe to that view. However, it makes sense that those words of Isaiah chapter 40 are written to encourage people that are exiles. And as we saw this morning, we studied about people that were in exile. Why is it that still to this day people read about those stories about the exiles of the Jews in Babylon? Why? Because there's something in those stories that doesn't just speak about the Jews 2,000 years ago, but it's something that speaks to us. Otherwise, if it had no interest to us, we would stop reading it. But those texts have weathered 6,000, 4,000, 2,000 years of history. Why? Because they are relevant to the human beings who read them whenever they read them. Whether they are American citizens who live in America, or whether they were exiles in Babylon with their homeland in Israel. And why is that story of the exile one that is relevant to us? Because we are all, to some degree, exiles. The Bible goes and tells us how our first parents, Adam and Eve, were exiled from the Garden of Eden. And then after this, if that is not enough of a hint, aren't we all exiles from the perfect bliss of floating in amniotic fluid. And then after this, with this ideal of a promised land that we have, we know can be achieved, however, exiled sometimes in the land of disappointments and hardships and trials and so on and so forth. So the experience of exile is a deeply human one that covers all of humanity, not just the Jews that were in Israel. And those words from Isaiah 40 are of comfort to those who are in such situation. Now, of course, today we pretty much feel very thankful. Why? Because we've all driven from Minnesota, from California, from wherever it is, Connecticut, and we are all together for Thanksgiving. So, oh, wow, how, we, how are we not lucky and blessed? But isn't that true that sometimes there are moments of mm, disappointments, discouragement, and sadness in our lives when we are exiled from that land of perfect bliss? So here, these words that come at the end that talk about strength, those who trust in the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not faint. They shall walk and not faint. Well, these come at the end of a chapter that's filled with not just encouragement, but also memory verses. It's packed with such. The very first words of that chapter. Comfort ye. Comfort ye, my people. Have you heard those words before? Around the Christmas season? In Handel's Messiah? Speak comfort to Jerusalem. You have had enough trouble. Her warfare is ended. Her iniquity is pardoned. She has received from the Lord double up for her sins. You've had enough trouble. Comfort for you in your hardships. Then from verse 3, another set of another stanza in a poem that in the poem there that is very well known from Isaiah 40. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. That also is part of the Messiah by Handel. Talking about John the Baptist. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make the crooked place straight. For the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Every valley shall be exalted. Of course, I'm not that great of a singer. But uh, you know that it's very famous. All this packed in one chapter. Verse 6, all flesh is grass. The grass weathers, the flower fades. But, and here's the contrast that first hints at what the choice is that will be placed before you and me by reading this chapter. All flower, all flesh is like grass, but the word of the Lord 
endures forever. There's a contrast being made here. If you look at what there is that is human, if you put your trust into what is human, as if it were God that is placing it as an idol, that's not going to work because there's only one thing that really is strong and the warranter of all things. It's the power of God. Then there's some more. That God is coming. That God that is powerful, the God who has a word that lasts forever. It says, don't be afraid. Behold, verse 10, God shall come with a strong hand. His reward is with him. And verse 11, once again, that comfort. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. I've sung this beautiful part of Handel's Messiah with Rebecca. I think that you were singing this with also with your, with your roommate uh, at WA. Remember her name? Forget her name. You sung that together. And gently lead those who are with young. This chapter 40 of Isaiah is packed. It's not just one memory verse. It's one after the other. Maybe it was because of Handel that we all know these words, but still memorable. All words of comfort and of encouragement to those who are in exile, who are not at their best, that there is a God who's able, who's coming, who wants to comfort them, who will deliver, and who will be like a shepherd, not like a rough ruler. From verse uh, 12 and on, there's a, uh, verse 12 to verse 26, I'll pass over this very quickly, but there is a comparison that is made of the power of God over those that seem powerful in the world. Who seems powerful in the world? Yes, Congress. Yes, the United States president. Yes, political structures. They certainly were powerful, not just, they're not just powerful in our time. They were powerful in the time of the Hebrews, when they were in Babylon and in Babylonia. The nations seem to be powerful. We are part of the most powerful, one of the most powerful nations on earth. Yes, sometimes we worry a little bit about China. You know, but for many people in the world, they look up to the United States, Russia, as being powerful. Nations seem to be powerful. And God is compared there, saying, you know what, they may be powerful, but I'm the one that's behind, the one that is the more powerful one. And indeed, we call this luck, but there are reversals in history that are unexpl unexplainable. Many a time, the story of the Battle of Waterloo is mentioned as something that shouldn't have happened. Napoleon should have worked, it should have worked to his advantage. It didn't. There's reversals, there are reversals in history that notwithstanding the apparent power of certain nations and certain rules and so on and so forth, chance seems to just have its way. That's when God says, I am the one in charge. Not always, but there's something that is not assured by human power. In verses 12 to 26, the comparison extends to all of Earth's inhabitants, the princes, and specifically the idols. Idols that a goldsmith will overcast with silver or with gold. An idol nowadays seems something very primitive to us, doesn't it? However, an idol is anything that we place where God should be in our lives. Believing that God, the personal God that we think there is in the universe, overlooks our lives, cares about us as we study this morning, and guides our lives to a good end in a good way. So, in those verses, from verse 12 to verse 26, the comparison is made of God as being the trustworthy only thing, the one that needs to be trusted, rather than to put any of the other things that seem to have power in his place. Specifically, for the exiles, it's not to put the Babylonians as if the Babylonians were God. They are not all-powerful, God says. The people that uh, you find oppressive because you are strangers in their land, they don't have all the power in the world. And to us, in our various lands of exile, we sometimes will hold some people as being the key to our either unhappiness or our happiness. Forgetting 
that the source of our happiness is not there. They may seem to have power, and they may have some power. However, it's another decision that we make that will give them the power to give us some happiness or not. And that choice is a different one. It's got to do with who we choose to trust. So in those verses, finally, we come to that last paragraph of chapter 40. And I'll read from verse 27, because verse 27 is the beginning of that last paragraph. And in the question that are being asked there, there's an attitude that is being described. Why do you say, O Jacob, and why do you speak, O Israel? Why do you say, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. In this question, we see that the people of Jacob, the ones that are in exile, say, you know, there may be God up there, but he doesn't care about us. That God here is unable and unwilling to do anything for me. There's therefore an attitude of distrust in God because he can't do much. It's an attitude, that is, an attitude that is pessimistic. There's nothing that can be done. Even God doesn't care about me. The key to my cell has been thrown away into a deep river, never to be re retrieved. And Oh, well, nothing to be done. It's an Eeyore attitude. Why do you say, O Jacob, why do you speak, O Israel? Why do you ask, my way is hidden from the Lord and my just claim is passed over by my God? And then we read those verses, summarizing a whole chapter of comfort, of encouragement, that God has not forgotten, that God is powerful, that everything else is following what he says. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. That's the unwearied God. His understanding is unsearchable. His wisdom is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men that are strong will utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord, and here we have a great promise attached to a great condition. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That great promise is one that most of us, at some point in our lives, needs. There is perhaps three stages of life. The romantic stage when you soar with idealistic ideas then maybe there's the one where you are fully proficient and running uh, as an athlete, still young in your life, until perhaps a third stage sets in when you can hardly walk, if with a walker even, perhaps. But whether it is three stages of life or three different attitudes in life, there is a great promise attached to those three things. Those who trust in the Lord shall renew their strength. Don't we need to have a renewal of strength? And then mount up. That talks to us about buoyancy. For those who've been on the seas, you know that buoyancy is the quality of things that rise up to the top of the water. Buoyancy is something that allows, because of air, because of something, allows things that otherwise would go down to rise up above. So in the Christian language, we know about the expressions rising above temptations, rising above difficulties, rising above the fray. Things that bother us in life exist and will continue to exist. That's the nature of life. However, to have buoyancy and to rise up to where you can see those things in perspective as things that may not be controlling your life, but just annoyances here and there. What a blessing that is. 
That's part of the great promise. Those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They will have a lofty life, not one that is down below, but up above. In Colossians, we're being told that our citizenship is not on earth. Our citizenship is not even in this country. Our true citizenship is where? In heaven. Now, of course, heaven as something that's up in space is a little something that, man, I pass some difficulties to think. But, yeah, to be able to have a distance between yourself and the difficulties of life, what a blessing. It's not the end of the world. To have peace above the fray. And then from that perspective, to be able to have a comprehensive vision of what really matters in life and what to do about it. All this. And this is something that is done with wings as of eagles. I love to drive in southwestern Wisconsin and see all these beautiful bald eagles. When I went to Tel Aviv, I went on the wings of a plane. But what, what are the wings that allow us to have buoyancy and rise up above the fray. Some people, many people, some people have different names for this. People that, I don't, I, I don't want to be overly inclusive, but people that talk about meditation, part of it. In our Christian language, we sing sweet hour of prayer as the prayer, as the wings that allow us to rise above the fray. And so trusting the Lord here expresses itself in taking advantage of that quiet time that Marcia was talking about this morning so that you can rise and see the problems for the little ants that they are. See the great God that's in control as the great God that he is. And see your task and your purpose in this that you can achieve, notwithstanding the difficulties that you experienced in the experience of exile on earth. Second beautiful promise you find there is that they run and will not be weary. Even when you run, you have different paces. You have people that seemingly achieve a lot more than others. I have great admiration for some people who achieved a lot. Sometimes, looking at myself and think, if I achieved as much, but you know what? Running is something everybody does at some point in their life. Uh, in the Bible, there's different paces as well. Achimaaz he ran faster than Cushai. And in the New Testament, we read that John reached the tomb before Peter, as the two of them had run to the tomb of Jesus on Easter morning. So yeah, people run differently and faster or slower. However, the main thing here is that in that marathon that life is, because life is not a sprint, it's a marathon, it's a long distance race. The promise that we get here is that those who trust in the Lord will receive the strength they need not to be wearied. They will receive strength from an unwearied God. And I'll go briefly to the last, the third one of those great promises. When they walk, they will not faint. Um, maybe we should add one more step. The next step after walking Maybe to be still, still here. There's a promise in the scripture. Be still and know that I am God. And for those that may actually lie down, as it is the destiny of every human being. We don't have to be puzzled by the natural law of inertia, of, of decay, of downward, that all living towards, uh, tends towards death without any hope. Because in John chapter 11, close to the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus said, he that believes in me shall never die. And so there is hope even, even beyond this, if we want to think of it. God has a plan beyond this. So here, uh, those that are at the stage of walking or at the uh, time of walking in their life can be assured that strength is renewed in them so that they do not faint. Because on eagle's wings, by the power of that unwearied God, the path of the just shines brighter onto the perfect day on a constant basis. So we have these beautiful promises that are found there in that verse, the last verse of chapter 40 of Isaiah. And the question here is, how do we take a hold of these great promises? 
because that great promise in three parts is attached to a great condition. And what's the great condition at the very beginning of verse 40, 31? Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who, those who wait on the Lord. There's two things there. Waiting. Waiting here is a word that in Hebrew, le kavot, has at its root the word kav, which is a line or a rope. It's to be tied up in, with, with that all-powerful God in a way that we participate in his life and in his future, which is a good one. But in our English language, to wait upon has many facets of uh, meaning. One would be service, like a servant waits on his master. What are some of the other areas of meaning that we find in the word to wait? To have expectation, to have patience, to wait on somebody, to be willing to receive instructions. It's an expression of dependence upon God. Those who wait upon the Lord are those who are dependent on. So it's an attitude that has many shades of meaning, but it's an attitude of being tied up in hope, and in a, if I was going to give it one summary word, it would be to, to wait in a positive attitude that's linked, that's based, that's warranted by the power of God, which we see at work everywhere we look at, in nature, in the stars, as well as in the micro uh, elements of uh, life, organic life. And then after this, it's not just waiting on anybody. Because in the chapter, we read of those, about those who wait on idols. And idols are so, such a temptation for us to wait on. To wait on something or somebody to give you the satisfaction and the relief that you need in your land of exile. Addictions of any kind. Things, activities, people. Many of these things that are good have their place in our lives. However, what is it that makes them idols? It is our positioning them in first place where only God should sit. Instead of positioning them where God has placed them as part of creation. In other words, it's important to have good relationships, but relationships are not as important as the relationship that one has with God. Work, same thing. Good food and health, same thing. All of these that are good can be idols, and we are told here not to wait on them, but to only wait on the Lord. In obedience, in expectancy that he overrules everything and will carry out his good purposes in our lives. That he has the divine power to do that. So here on the Lord is Old Testament dialect for the New Testament phraseology, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And all this still seems to me a little too theological. But the way that I would like to translate that to you is that the way that we have that I would think I have a renewal of my strength and a renewal of youth is by having, making a choice between two attitudes. The first one is the one that's not the good one, the one that is exemplified in verse 27. Why do you say God is not helpful? It's an attitude of distrust in God that then finds substitutes in things that are not God. That's the first attitude, and that's the wrong one. Whereas the second one, which I have the choice to choose in verse 31 is, but those who wait on the Lord. And to me, that means something very simple. Besides trusting in some theological God in heaven, in the head, that is there. I'm not saying that he's not. But that has to do with one thing. It's to apply that trust that there is in God to all the people and the things that there is in my life. So 
instead of having a distrusting attitude towards a person, is to have an attitude of that person wanting something by the grace of God, by the Spirit of God, that is good as well. Jesus, when he talked, as a text that I've mentioned many times, he's extended his divinity and his person to all of his brothers and sisters that have been incarnated like he was incarnated. And then, um, uh, so there is, there, is, there is a process there in, we can, in which we can trust other human beings. That makes a difference to have an, an attitude of optimism and trust towards others rather than to have them locked up into pessimistic ideas that they cannot improve and that they want evil towards you. To have an attitude of trust, not because of who they are, but because of God in the systems around us. There's people that are completely played with conspiracy theories of all kinds. Is this helpful? To be dumb? No. However, to imagine that there's a devil's tail under every pillow, is it helpful? No. To trust the universe, that's the way that many non-theists talk about God. To trust that everything is going to good end because that's the way it's programmed by God, because of the strength of God as we believe it. To believe in nature, to believe in uh, the respect of, God, of God's laws in nature, to believe and trust that God's timing will be good without fretting about impatience and uh, about uh, mistiming of things in our lives, to go with the flow. All these are expression to me of what it means to trust in the Lord, but them who trust in the Lord. It's having an attitude of trust, of tolerance, of patience, of gratitude, of positive expectancy, rather than, instead of an attitude of fear, of reactivity and complaining and discontent and negative, of distrust, of anger and suspicion to others and to the world around us. Not putting them in the place of God, but because of who God is and is being talked about in this book, to believe that he can carry out his purposes through them, through all these things, and therefore extending the trust that I have in God to them as well. Over mistakes that they make, over errors, over words and actions that were made that obviously were not meant. To trust that God is acting a good end in a good way. This is the challenge that I find myself with, like the Israelites that were in exile in Babylon back then. This is the challenge that, of the choice that I have, that you have today. Why would I say, Jacob, why would you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and be negative? When the secret of having renewed strength is to keep hope in one's heart, to keep that positive, looking forward attitude that we can have, be because of who God is. So, without any further, I'm going to invite you to think about this as I propose to you to sing together, page 590. It's not a Christmas song, but it's a trust that because of Christmas we can have. Trust and obey. See how much we can put this into action to have that attitude of trust in God which brings to us the great promises of mounting up with wings like eagles, of running without being weary, of walking without fainting, knowing that God will lead us and bring us to his perfect place at the perfect time. stand. Bye.
is with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but he smiles quickly, drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no I want to, uh, at the beginning of this season, looking towards Christmas, uh, and at the end of the year, uh, take a choice. And we want to all respond to that choice that is given in your word. To have an attitude of trust and of hope and of gratitude, knowing that the God of hope that you are will fill us with all strength, joy, peace, as we trust you, so that we may overflow with hope by the power of your Holy Spirit. Glory be to you, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory be to you from generation to generation, in the past, in the present, and the future, in the church, and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.